I'm Louis Alexander Waldman, Associate Professor of Art History at the University of Texas at Austin, and I'm here to talk about one of the greatest works of Renaissance Italy, The David by Michelangelo Buonarroti. At the end of the 15th century in Florence, the Medici family, which had dominated the government of, of the city for decades, had been driven out, and there was a void of power that had been occupied first by an ecclesiastical figure, Fra Girolamo Savonarola. Girolamo Savonarola was a fundamentalist friar who dominated the city for, for four years uh, until he was burned at the stake in 1494. After that, a government that was secular was created under the control of a lifetime leader named Piero Soderini. Piero Soderini set about reinforcing the civic pride of the Florentines, who had been humiliated by the invasion of a young French king, Charles VIII. Piero Soderini had been appointed the lifetime ruler of Florence in 1501, and he would soon become one of the young Michelangelo's leading supporters. Michelangelo was only 26 years old, but he had already made a name for himself due to his creation of the St. Peter's Pietà. David was important as an example of wise kingship, but to the Florentines at this time, he was even more important as an underdog. In the Bible, the, the, the Israelites had been under attack by a giant named Goliath, who had defeated all of their champions. A young shepherd boy, just a teenager, came forward, David, and asked to fight the giant. The king of the Israelites, Saul offered David his armor. David refused. He wanted to fight without any weapons except his slingshot. The king said, go forward. The young boy David defeated the giant Goliath with one rock thrown against his head. And then, drawing his sword, he cut the giant's head off, put it up high, where the enemy could see it, and the enemy were so frightened that they ran off and the Israelites were saved. Thus a young boy saved God's chosen people, according to the Bible, not through his own strength, but by being the vessel of God's righteous will. This was the image that the Florentines liked to cultivate of themselves, a country that was weaker than some of its enemies, but that was, that was supported by the righteousness of God that saw itself as having God on its side. Michelangelo received the commission in 1501, but he was by no means the first person to begin to work on this block. In fact, the project went back decades earlier uh, to about 15, 1460, when Donatello, who was the greatest sculptor in Florence in the 15th century, the preceding century, uh, was given the block with the idea of carving it into a statue. Donatello was then a very old man, and one of his assistants started working on the block. Donatello promptly died, and the block was abandoned, and it just lay on its side outside the cathedral workshops for decades. People came along at various times and offered to carve the, the block into a statue, but they all said, basically, the block is ruined, uh, it's been hacked away, we don't know what it was supposed to look like, it's full of holes where the legs are separated and probably the arms, and, and we don't really know how to make it into a statue unless we add some pieces of marble to it. Now the problem with that was that the Florentines had an almost religious uh, aversion to the idea of adding blocks to a marble statue. Marble was a subtractive sculptural medium. If you're going to make a statue out of clay, it's fine to add pieces. If you're making a statue out of marble, you can only subtract. To add a piece of stone to a carved stone statue was nothing less than cheating. So anyone who came along and said they could finish the statue, but they'd have to add some pieces, was turned down pretty much flat. That's where Michelangelo comes in. The young Michelangelo offered audaciously to complete the statue without adding a single piece to it. In fact, in a book that was written by a close friend of his, and that 
many people consider to be a kind of ghost-written autobiography. Uh, it was claimed that Michelangelo had left the original skin of the marble on top of the head and the original skin at the bottom of the statue. In other words, leaving, leaving the, the original dimensions of the block intact. He was so economical of the marble. Now, the way that Michelangelo was able to do this was a tremendous tour de force. It was considered to be one of the greatest technical achievements of Renaissance Italy. Why did he want to do this? Why did the young 26-year-old sculptor want to do this? Well, for one thing, there was never a block of marble this big since ancient Roman times. To bring a block of marble to Florence like this was itself one of the great technical achievements of Renaissance art. A block like this begins in the top of the mountains at Carrara, outside the Florentine territory in the province of Massa. The block has to be lowered with ropes and skids and sleds, the same way that it was into the early 20th century, by hand, slowly, slowly, in dangerous work. Gradually, it reaches the bottom of the mountain, where it's loaded onto an ox cart using cranes and, again, manual labor, manual sweat. Once the oxen pull it to the port, it's loaded with more sweat and labor onto a ship, where it's taken to uh, it's taken to a port, it's loaded onto a barge, floated up the Arno River to the place where the Arno River becomes too shallow, then it's loaded onto another ox cart, and then it's carted to Florence where it's moved with lots and lots more sweat equity to the workshop of the cathedral. Now imagine moving the largest block of marble that had been quarried in a thousand years all the way from the top of an alpine mountain to the cathedral workshops of Florence. This would had never happened in a thousand years, and it wasn't going to happen again. How could Michelangelo resist? Now, one of the first things that you notice about Michelangelo's David is that it is completely nude. This was unique and remarkable, and contemporaries were aware of this remarkable fact. This was the first statue of David to be completely nude. If we look at the earlier statues of David in Florence by Donatello, for instance, or other artists, they were clothed, or at least partly clothed. For Michelangelo to take the, the unprecedented step of making a completely nude statue of David, Michelangelo was saying something. He was stressing the vulnerability of David, completely nude before the giant the armored warrior who was much, much larger than he was, stressing the weakness, stressing the absolute helplessness of this young boy who was not victorious through his own strength, but was victorious through the righteous might of his God. That is how the Florentines wanted to see themselves. How else does Michelangelo's David differ from preceding examples of the subject? Well, one important way is that earlier examples of the subject always show David victorious, having cut off the head of Goliath. He basks in his moment of victory. Not so Michelangelo's David. Michelangelo shows his figure before the battle, when everything is still in play, when the outcome is still up in the air. In fact, he hasn't thrown the rock yet. He's holding it in his big right hand. He holds the sling over his shoulder and he's just reaching over to grab it because he's only just this moment realized that the giant has hoved into view. He's in the moment where he's just begun the motion of beginning to put the rock into the sling and beginning the action that will prove decisive. We don't know at this point what the outcome will be. It's a little bit like the difference between, uh, between the decisive moment of action and the anticlimax. Michelangelo chooses the moment before the climax, while others making other, other sculptors' versions of the story seem anticlimactic by comparison. Part of the sense of dynamic potential movement in the statue is conveyed by a device that had been known to sculptors since the times of the ancient Greeks. 
contrapposto. Contrapposto is the putting of weight on one leg of the body so that the other leg hangs mostly free. This conveys the sense of potential movement and a sense of energy. This is how one naturally stands and it conveys a sense of lifelikeness. It gives a feeling that the David has been standing in a way that he's free to burst into movement at any moment and it makes him extremely, extremely realistic. At the same time, if we look at the David from other points of view, from the side or from the rear, he doesn't really have a lot going on in terms of the dynamism of his pose. He's pretty, yeah, it's pretty boring if we look at him from other points of view than the front. And this is a fact that co contemporaries noted and complained about. It really wasn't Michelangelo's fault, though. The block was the block that he inherited. He didn't choose the block. It was flat because it was quarried for a specific statue that wasn't the one that Michelangelo created. Michelangelo had a block that was designed for a specific statue that we don't know, and he sort of sandwiched his own sculpture into this ruined block very, very cleverly. When Michelangelo had the choice, of choosing his own blocks. He chose blocks that were very deep so that he could make statues that twisted and turned and thus were interesting from every point of view. If the subject matter of the David is a biblical story about a young boy who defeats a fearsome giant and saves God's chosen people, what is the content? In some ways the content is politics. But in other ways, the content is beauty. The David is one of the most gorgeously idealized representations of the human body ever created. And it's finished with impeccable detail. Every, every surface of the figure and the head is rendered with a degree of finish, detail, that's absolutely gorgeous. And a degree of definition that goes beyond anything that any artist had ever attempted before. Michelangelo is obsessed with rendering every surface with a kind of laser-like precision. He's fascinated by the amount of detail that he can render on every part of the body. And in fact, it's, it's, it's absolutely rewarding to, to linger over every part of a figure by Michelangelo because one is just endlessly rewarded by seeing new layers of detail, new levels of articulation. He obsesses, obsesses, obsesses over every part of every figure. And with this comes a very high level of finish. Um, he polishes the David as he does whenever he can with his finished sculptures to a, a mirror-like level of finish. This is something that's very much a part of his aesthetic. Even though we know that Michelangelo left many of his sculptures unfinished, this was not his choice. As many people believed in the 19th century, in the Romantic era, in reality his aesthetic was one of high, high finish. And we see that in an early work like the David, which just gleams. Uh, with an almost mirror-like perfection achieved through hundreds and hundreds of hours of hand polishing with pumice stone. There's a kind of hyper-delineation in the details of Michelangelo's figures, and you see this very clearly in the eyes, the beetling brows, in the, the, the wrinkled forehead and nose of Michelangelo's David. This yields a kind of feeling of intensity that really, really translates into a psychological state of mind. This intense state of mind had a name for contemporaries who called it terribilita. Terribilita is an Italian word that means a kind of absolutely awesome internal fire. And people of Michelangelo's time used the word terribilita to refer not only to Michelangelo's figures, which seemed to burn with an inner fire, but they applied it to him as well. I've talked about the question of nudity, the fact that this was the first 
nude depiction of David. How did people think about this? Were they okay with nudity? Not really. We know from documents that almost immediately when the statue was finished, the government commissioned people to make a laurel crown to go on its head, symbolizing the idea that he was a victor, and some leaves to go around its waist to cover up its nudity. This suggests two things. One, that the Florentines were not entirely comfortable with a completely naked statue of a man uh, three or four times the size of life in front of their palace. But it also suggests to me that they weren't entirely comfortable with the idea of a David who still hadn't won the combat. They weren't entirely comfortable with a David whose victory was still in the balance. And so they had to give him a, a laurel crown, symbol of victory, in order to put the question to rest. Yes, in fact, he did win the combat with the giant Goliath. 